Hey everyone, it's Ornlu, and well, we've had another 1v1 tournament uh, conclude just this past weekend. Uh, that was the Wandering Warriors Cup, which yeah, you can see the logo there. And as I do for most of like the, the big tournaments in AoE2, uh, I'm just going to do a recap of the event. I'm going to talk about, well, as you can see there, the results and the storylines, um, the more in-game meta-y stuff, like how the Age of Empires 2 was played, and then I wrap things up with a more broad, uh, like, how does this tournament impact the whole AoE community and the whole AoE scene? So, with all of that in mind, this video is going to have plenty of spoilers, like literally all of them. So if you don't want to be spoiled, run, run, run away. Are you running? Are you running? Are you running? Are you running? All right, let's start by getting into the uh, results of the event. Uh, I guess I should first say that the whole premise of this tournament, it is, of course, uh, hosted and organized by uh, Dave and T90, and its theme is, okay, it's a 1v1 event, but it's focused on nomad-ish ish maps, I want to say, and hybrid maps. I'll get to that in a bit. Haha, -ha, now I'm on the other side of the screen. So yes, this tournament, it did go from uh, January until the beginning of February of 2022. So definitely like very early on in the year. And this is going to be like the first big tournament of, well, 2022. A $25,000 prize pool, so nice chunk of change for being a completely new tournament concept. And the way that it worked is it was a big old 1v1 single elimination uh, bracket. So... As you can see, lots and lots of brackety stuff going on. Now, beyond that, uh, we had this whole system, and I'll, I'll get to this more in a little bit, where game one was always played on Nomad, which was, it's essentially a version of Nomad that was very similar to the classic one. Um, nothing too wild about that. But then you had a bunch of other map types where you didn't start with a TC, and then also Houseboat, where you started with a TC. I'm probably getting ahead of myself. Let's just talk about who uh, who played and who won. So, I guess one of the first controversies of the tournament is that the seeding was done purely by ladder rating. And ladder rating is a bit of a suspect seeding method at the best of times, that it's used simply because, well, we don't usually have anything better. Uh, but with it being the holidays, Remember, like, when all of the, you know, early stages and stuff, it was the holidays, and then you had Age of Empires 4, which people are, you know, s uh, splitting their time between. Uh, the seating was especially weird, you could say. Uh, and because it's a single elimination bracket, we did have some early, I guess, like, big knockouts. Like, for instance, Jordan versus Leary meeting in the round of 16. Um, so definitely, like, it's rough for Jordan. But, you know, that's just how it works out, how it, you know, all of the, the seeding worked out. Uh, but in the end, it was the Viper winning once again. Uh, this does make, what, how many tournaments in a row now? Four? Like, major S-tier tournaments? The Viper is back. He is looking very dominant. Had a strong performance throughout the entire event. Dropped one game to Licks, which was a fantastic game. Um, then breezed through Barrels. Breezed through Mr. Yo. Mr. Yo looked completely outclassed on that day. Um, had a really close set uh, with Tato, heartbreaker of a last game. Um, somebody posted on Reddit, uh, I forget who the Reddit user was, I'm sorry about that. Uh, but like Tato is apparently like 0 for 14 in like sets that go to the decider game. So it's like he always loses if it goes the distance. But like he keeps on going the distance every time. It's like, oh, such a heartbreaker for the guy. But still, semifinal uh, finish, not at all bad. And then Doubt making his first uh, major tournament finals after, uh, in around a year actually, since Red Bull Wallalo 3, where he famously clinched that one against Leary. Uh, finals, okay-ish, to be honest. Viper looked pretty dominant, so not a whole lot to say about that. Um, other interesting results, Doubt did uh, beat Leary 3-2 and actually reversed swept Leary. Uh, and, and definitely there were some interesting games in there. Um... Doubt over Valesa, definitely a solid result. Uh, Vinchester making another semifinal appearance, uh, actually beating Kapoch in a very close set, but Kapoch himself barely edging out over backed. So definitely pretty uh, pretty close, but like once you ran into, I think, Doubt, Tato, and Viper, uh, they were by far the most prepared uh, when it came to all of the very unique maps uh, that we saw in this event. 
So they definitely looked quite good. Uh, Bad Boy, with his best tournament result, uh, like individually by far, he did have a very easy bracket. 3-0 Stark, 3-2 Classic Pro, 3-1 Sato. Like, those are all good results, but it, like he ran into a brick wall when he when he hit Tato. It, it wasn't very close. But still, a round of eight in a major tournament is nothing to be scoffed at, and that's, what, $812.50. That is interesting. Like, very specific number. But regardless, still, good result for him. Have to keep, be on the lookout for him in the future. Let's see, nothing too crazy there. Oh yeah, Hera... Barely edging out over Draken, and then losing to Mr. Yo. Again, another knockout in the round of 16. A slam getting knocked out in the round of 32. Just, well, if you're poor Slam and just run into Mr. Yo in the round of 32, that's pretty rough. But even still, Slam pushing Yo to a game number five. Hera generally looking outclassed by Yo, um, but there were still some very, very close games there. So it's like, it's an unfortunate result for Hera, but this is, again, single elimination bracket with all over the place seating. So there was a little bit of ran randomness involved, but when you look at the top players, I do think that Viper and Doubt, number one and two in the tournament, I don't think that's too much of a stretch. Maybe you could say Tato was also up there, but that was semifinal. Again, all very close. So in the end, we're still looking at a really strong result here for Gamer Legion getting three out of the top four. So you can tell that preparation really paid off with these settings, which, speaking of which, so... Yeah, as I mentioned before, the map draft was pretty simple. Nomad and then loser pick uh, a home map out of the remaining seven, I believe. And then they did a sieve draft uh, with the interesting caveat being that uh, once you hit the round of 64, the most popular sieve in the round of 64 would be banned, which was in this case Spanish. And then they did the same thing in the round of 32, round of 16, round of eight. So we lost Spanish, Malians, Persians, and then Italians throughout the tournament. For some reason, they stopped at the round of eight. I don't really know why, but... It is what it is. And so there was at least some amount of Civ variety encouraged to some degree. Uh, but that really kind of brings us to the maps, which oh, no, I'm going to zoom in. So the maps, honestly, I'm not a big fan of them, uh, except for Nomad. Like Nomad is fine. When you're creating a 1v1 tournament that's like big, big prize pool, it's really difficult to create maps that are fair and like... There, there's enough competitive integrity uh, that, you know, it's like a real tournament, right? With so much money being on the line. It's not just, you know, you're playing Hearthstone in 2015 or whatever it was. But yeah, the maps, a lot of them felt very similar and they felt very snowball-y. Nomad itself actually did produce a fair amount of good games, but the Civ variety was very minimal. Um, there's like maybe a little bit, but it's like the, the Civs that were banned, like we saw like the Civs every single time until they were banned. Which wasn't super great, but still, like I said, we had some good games here and there. Mired, I thought, was a really bad map. There was maybe like one or two good games on it. That's the one that had all of the boars in the middle. He had ten boars in the middle. He started with a horse, and it was just a lot of laming and counter-laming and stuff like that. So maybe some people found that fun. Personally, I didn't. There was the very sad moment where Bact lost like four villagers to one tiger. That was very sad. But, eh. Uh, inundation, uh, that one was like, had all the gold in the middle. And I, I guess I should say right here that other than Nomad, despite this being like a Nomad style tournament, none of the other maps had like actual Nomad starts in the sense that your villagers were spread out everywhere. In fact, you, on the houseboat, you even start with a town center. <laughs> um, so like what you would do is like the villagers would all be scattered, but they'd all be right, right together in the middle of the map, which meant that really, you would just place your town center in the same exact location every time. And it's sort of, you're getting the effect of the map not being Nomad, which I kind of think takes away from the whole point of the tournament, but that's just me. Um, but yeah, there was Mired, Inundation, that one's kind of like Gold Rush, except there was like s some shallows involved. Some decent maps, but just very snowball-y. Houseboat, it did have some good games. I will grant it that. It's still not my favorite map in the universe, but at least the the level of game, I think, was... Or, like, how much... How enjoyable the average game was, I think, was at least, like, a little bit higher than average. Uh, Grapple actually ended up being a pretty good map, I think. Um, the whole Nomad start was kind of a moot point because you would just, like, drop your TC as close as possible. Uh, and that was pretty much the same case with Inundation. You'd drop your TC in the middle, mired, you just go to the shallows... Or go to the shoreline and then drop your TC right away. So 
Not too sure about that, but it essentially played out uh, similar-ish to Baltic, but with some shore fish around the edges, which made Indians stronger for, you know, just because the shore fish were there, I guess. Uh, but still, Baltic is a good map, at least in my opinion. And there were some really good games. That Mr. Yo versus Hera game came to, comes to mind as well. Golden Hill. I thought we had banished this map from the uh, Nations Cup 2017 days. Uh, again, it's like the whole Nomad point was kind of lost because you would just go down the hill and build your TC as quickly as possible. And again, it's just a very snowball-y map. You know, you take water control, you take control of the middle, and then 90% of the time, the person who does that wins. Compass. I'll, I'll, I'll do Compass last. Boundary bar Brawl. Yeah. We saw very rarely. It was the site of the saddest game I have ever seen, which was uh, between Mr. Yo and the Viper where Yo managed to lose a villager before he started his, or before he completed his town center and then he killed the boar with his town center so he couldn't harvest it with food um and viper was chinese so it was like two villagers to six and he just instantly resigned after like two and a half minutes game time or something very sad and it's kind of like okay you have the hunt in the middle so you have the hunt in the middle map the gold in the middle map um but actually you have two gold in the middle maps and then the boars in the middle maps like a lot of like stuff in the middle maps and then you had Compass, which, as much as I love the map in OBNC, and this is more or less the same map, it just had some shallows, it just doesn't work for 1v1, particular, particularly in the sense of you started with two fishing ships. Why on earth you started with two fishing ships, I have no idea, but it made Chinese, like, straight up broken. I Maybe there was one game I saw where Chinese were played on this map and they lost, but it was, like, insane. When you start with those two fishing ships on a nomad-style map, and you can build the dock right away, it means that those fishing ships are going to be gathering as you're building your town center, so that when you complete your town center, you can then just start training villagers immediately. And normally Chinese are balanced by the fact that, you know, you can't do that. You have to get loom right away most of the time, and then you have to just wait until you gather enough food to start build your production, Chinese starting with uh, minus 200 food. So, yeah, really not a fan of that map. There was maybe like one good game here. And I think this just sort of speaks to the broader issue in that, yeah, the maps, I, I just didn't think there were that many good games. There were good games, don't get me wrong. There were some fantastic games, but it's like the average game, you could say, wasn't really the very interesting. And maybe that has to do with just, you know, mismatch of player skill level or something, but they just felt very snowbally and very similar. And like most had some sort of water aspect, but it wasn't like a full water map. Which, of course, some people are really going to like. And they all just kind of had that sort of hybrid with, like, a little bit of a gimmicky thing, but not too much. So, I wasn't the biggest fan of that. Um, but still, there were some good games uh, and very some very, very memorable ones, too, which I think uh, is super important for a tournament, right? Uh, but really, that's all I had to say on the, the sieves and maps. We don't have a spreadsheet for this one. It's not that big of a deal. I mean, we just saw a lot of the same, a lot of same stuff over and over again. Uh, I will say that we did see some civs really get to shine that don't normally get to see a lot of play, like Koreans, like Portuguese, Byzantines to some degree. Uh, so we got to see those civs a lot, which definitely was a, a bit refreshing. Uh, and I like, I did like the progressive banning of civs. I actually think they could have done it like one step further, but still, it's a good start. And uh, yeah, let's go back to the other little slide thing. So I already talked a lot about some of the, like, the whole format thing and the small issues I had with it and talked about the sort of meta game, I guess, maps wasn't the biggest fan of. So really, we've covered most of the, the normal stuff here that I have for all of these recap videos. And uh, yeah, let's just move right over to the other one. Yeah, WWC Wandering Warriors Cup in AoE 2. Uh, general interest, uh, people definitely seemed interested in the event. Uh, there was a very high participation rate among all of the top players in AoE 2 right now, which is great to see, uh, because again, a lot of them are splitting time between AoE 2 and AoE 4, but still, people are interested in not just signing up for the tournament, but it was very clear that the successful players ended up practicing a lot, uh, which is great to see, because you want to see that preparation pay off. Um, and yeah, I think viewership was pretty good. Um, I don't really follow Facebook, but uh, I think T90 was doing pretty well for his Facebook numbers. Dave was certainly doing super well. Um, and yeah, like I said, I think there was just a lot of interest in the event. Um, and yes, this is Dave's first big 1v1 event. You know, he's so attached to T90 
that, you know, it might feel like, you know, things like Hidden Cup are, you know, Dave's event, but no, those were just T90s. This is actually, you know, it had Dave's name on it, and I think I could be wrong, but I'm pretty sure this, the concept was his. Um, and I say, like, big 1v1 event because he actually has run a ton of community um, or custom scenario tournaments, like, going way, way back to the prehistoric times. So he has a lot of tournament hosting experience, but this was, like, his first big S-tier uh, event. So, you know, kudos to him. I would say the whole thing ran fairly smoothly. Uh, it was mostly Rex, um, which has its, you know, upsides and downsides. But considering that we're doing matches online, uh, I think that Rex are creating a, a smoother experience in general. Um, event success. Uh, like I said, I think the event was, you know, pretty successful in terms of viewer numbers. Uh, I mean, you guys just let me know in the comments, of course, what you thought of the event. Did you enjoy Wandering Warriors Cup? It's a, a new tournament, which is something that we don't have all that often. We uh, The last one was, of course, uh, the Open Classic last, like, August. Um, usually it's just, you know, in AOE2, it's iterations of existing events. But it's good to see something new, something fresh, and that is what Wandering Warriors Cup uh, provided. So hopefully I think we can mix, even if it's not exactly this tournament format, I mean the name like sure keep the name but i still like the idea of having something that is more nomad focused that's that's a word now um as it just shows age of empires 2 being played in a different way which i i think is really fun i think that there's just so much to enjoy in this game and a lot of times in wwc we were able to see those you know less common situations that you might not experience playing 1v1 arabia So I really think that's uh, all I have for this recap. Uh, it was pretty fast, but uh, that was just kind of the how WWC panned out. You know, it's not like the biggest, most hyped tournament out there. It was just a good, solid Age of Empires tournament um, that I enjoyed, and hopefully you guys did too. So definitely kudos to Dave and T90 for uh, doing this one, and thank you all so much for watching this video, and I'll see you guys next time.